Hello and welcome to this open discussion of World War II. Uh, people have asked me, when are you going to do more history videos, more geography videos? I said, well, I, I want to. Um, I done, I've done many, many. I'm not just going to come up with topics, you know, just to say, oh, let me fulfill an obligation. I wouldn't do that. But uh, I said, well, 75th anniversary coming up of the the Normandy landings, D-Day. Next year will be the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. Uh, so, hey, why not talk about it? Uh, I said in the commentary below or the description below, I said a better name for it would not be World War II, which is what it's commonly called, or the Second World War, but maybe a better name would be the World War Part II. Because a lot of historians talk about how it's a continuation of the first. First got called off and then restarted. You could look at it that way, I think. Um, somebody said it. Are those bank boxes? You know, what are those bank boxes? These are not bank boxes. These are com boxes for, full of comic books. And these boxes fall apart. They, uh, they get dry rotted really over time. They start to deteriorate and have to replace them. So I have a spinach salad with some Polish, talking about World War II, Polish, or is this the Bavarian? I don't know, that would fit too, Bavarian sauerkraut, olive, some fried onions. I'm gonna eat something later in a little while, but. Uh, so feel free to ask any question uh, in the comments, the chat, and, um, Or if you're really feeling brave, you know, join the chat live and, and give your opinion. Um, I have a lot of interesting books about the Second World War. My grandfather was in the war. He landed at a Normandy but on D-Day plus four he was at the uh, at uh, at um, in Belgium when the attack came December 16, 1944. I think he was on the north side of the bulge at Stavolo. He said it upset him because um, there was a nurse, I guess he, she was nice and he, he, he liked her. And, uh, when the Germans made their artillery attack, she was killed right there by them. And so he said that was pretty bad. But he went all over. He was in um, England, then France, Germany. At the end of the war, he was in Czechoslovakia, or Czechia, we call it today Czech Republic, uh, which he said he had an enjoyable time going fishing on this mountain lake for the multi-ethnic crew. Huh. Like myself, he was always anti-war. But curiously, uh, he supported John McCain, and I was thinking, why would he support if he's anti-war, right? Why would he support John McCain, which seems oxymoronic, you know? But uh, like I said, feel free to ask me any question about World War II. I can't say I'll be able to answer it. I'd be curious to discuss it, discuss any comments you'd like to make. Um, I have some very interesting books about the war.
show you these books. I think it's over here. Oh, yeah. Here's one of them. Here's the other one, conveniently, right by one next to the other. Very good, very good, very good. Very good. I'm going to show you some interesting. I uh, collect old books. I have a, a lot of old books. Uh, unfortunately, there was a whole series I could have gotten from the 1800s, but the school, the high school I taught at, decided to throw them in the dumpster. I said, why would you throw away books, leather-bound books, from the 1890s they said well you were the only person to ever check them out so that's really strange you know a library throwing away books that are over 100 years old i said just think if you'd have called me i would have driven over there and gotten every single book okay first Oh, and I have this beer. <laughs> Look at this. I like this hazy thing. I'm going to post a review tomorrow from Natchez, Mississippi. 6%. It was so full of yeast chunks. It was just mad, man. crazy, crazy. First book. The New Map of Europe, 1911 to 1914, Herbert Adams Gibbons. Uh, I got this very cheaply somewhere. Uh, the Balkan Peninsula shown in 1914. Okay, it's from 1915. The book is from, I said 16, 1915. Third edition, originally came out November 1914. To my children, Christine Este of Adana, Lloyd Irving of Constantinople, and Emily Elizabeth of Paris. Born in the midst of wars and changes that this book describes, may they lead lives of peace. I'm sure they're all passed away now, unless they're 105, 106 years old. Gift of the people of the United States through the Victory Book Campaign of the USO to the armed forces and merchant marine, huh? Mm -hmm. I highlighted some things in this book. Germany and Alsace Lorraine, but you say, well, this is about World War II. Why are you reading a book about World War I? Well, you probably realize you can't understand the second without understanding the first, uh, but I, I highlighted some things. Oh, boy. Omar says, an info on Axis Heavy Water Development Program. They were working on it. The Allies kept bombing their heavy water plants. They weren't able to develop it like they wanted to. Uh, was there a possibility that Germany could have, and when you say Axis, you mean Germany, because Italy and Japan had no chance, you know, no hope, and not to mention Slovakia and Bulgaria and Romania and Finland, had no hope of developing nuclear, you know, atomic weapons, but Germany had some hope. I always heard they were close to having an atomic bomb. Omar, they weren't close, although they had potential down the road, but the Allies kept bombing those facilities because they didn't want them to develop that because they were working on it themselves. So it didn't come to much, you know. Uh, let's see, here we go, culture comp. They're talking about, this is an anti-German book as a British author. Um, he says, uh, the belief of the German people in the superiority of their race and its world civilizing mission is a sober fact, he says. The anthropolo anthropologist Woltman, Woltman said, quote, 
the German is the superior type of the species, Homo sapiens, from the physical as well as the intellectual point of view. Uh, Worth declared that uh, the time is near when the earth must inevitably be conquered by the Germans. Yeah. The scientific book, a serious one in which these statements occur, was so popular that it sold five editions in three years. Paulson remarked that, quote, humanity is aware of and admires the German omnipresence. Hartman taught that the European family is divided into two races, male and female of which the first, of course, was exclusively German, while the second included Latins, that would be the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italians, the Romanians, I'm talking about language, the Celts, the Celts, the Britain, Britons, Brittany, Brit, Brit, British, Irish, and Slavs, Eastern European. He says, marriage is inevitable. So he's using an allegory. There's two, two, two types of Europeans, he said, the male Germans and the female, the rest of Europe, and they're gonna get married. Huh? Uh, Goethe expressed in Faust the opinion that the work of the Germans was to make the habitable world worth living in, while Schiller boasted, our language shall reign over the whole world and that the German day lasts until the end of time, oh, blah, 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 blah. All right. Um, In 1902, Kaiser William, the Emperor William II said, it is the empire of the world that the German genius aspires. Sound like an American president. All right, God has called us to civilize the world. We are the missionaries of human progress. Huh, he must've been a neoconservative. <laughs> okay, well, better not say too much. All right, so anyway, uh, going on, here we go, here's a quote from the book. Does the propagation of an ideal lead inevitably to a blind fanaticism where the dreamer becomes in his own imagination a chosen instrument of God to shed blood? Hmm. It sounds like uh, something many Americans will say, it's our duty to spread democracy around the world, even if we have to bomb people relentlessly into, and, so this is what he said. So here's the question the author is asking, Gibbons is asking, does the propagation spreading of an ideal philosophy, something you want to live up to, lead inevitably to a blind fanaticism where the dreamer becomes in his own imagination a chosen instrument of God to shed blood? And he says here, there is undoubtedly an intellectual and idealistic basis to German militarism and to German arrogance. And then he says, when German children have been for the past generation deliberately taught, as a matter of fact, not as an academic or a debatable question, that Deutschland, Germany, ought to be more than it is, we can understand how the neutrality of their smaller neighbors seems to the Germans a negligible consideration. Mm -hmm. All right. And he goes on and on and on and on. Uh, called, talk, talking about Welt politic, world politics. We'll get to this Japanese thing in a minute. Sotoli Tober says, since you just tried a beer called conspiracy theory, <laughs> right, have you heard the theory that Hitler escaped Germany and fled to Argentina via via submarine? Yes, I've heard that many times. I've heard it, yes. I'm actually quite familiar with that theory. But we have witnesses that he killed himself. He and his wife committed suicide. We have witnesses to that effect. You say, well, who are the witnesses? Oh, well, his most loyal allies, his closest inner circle. 
You say, where's the body? Well, uh, why ask Why ask troubling questions like that? All right. Talking about Japan entering the war. Now, here's a very interesting part of the book. People need to read old books. The entry of Japan into the war of 1914 is due to her desire to remedy a great injustice which has been done to Japanese commerce in the province of Shantung by the German occupation to her fear of this naval base opposite her coast, just as she feared Port Arthur. That was the Russian territory. Okay, so that's what he's saying at first. The Japanese felt intimidated by Germany. Now, now remember, 1914, what was it, November? Japan declared war on Germany. They were an ally in World War I. Japan was an ally of the, of the British and the French and the Italians against Germany. Now, they switched sides in World War II, but here's the key reason. And, quote, and they joined, quote, probably to the intention of occupying the Mariana Islands, the Marshall Islands, and the Eastern and Western Carolines in order that the Japanese Navy may have important bases in a possible future conflict with the United States. 1914, this was written, uh, and this is a revision, 1915 book. Why did Japan enter World War I? According to this British author, in order that the Japanese Navy may have important bases in a possible future conflict with the United States. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, we were so surprised at Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, sure, you know. Okay. <coughs> See. And then there's a chapter called the Baghdadian. The Baghdadian. Oh, the Baghdad bond. I'm sorry, the Baghdad bond. Not the Autobahn. You know, the Autobahn, the German superhighways, which we call interstate highways in the United States. The Baghdad bond. You say, what's the Baghdad bond? Well, that was a German idea. They were going to build a railroad from Berlin to the Persian Gulf. Berlin to Baghdad in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and then later a superhighway with automobiles, an interstate highway from Berlin to the Persian Gulf, they shot, you know, to like Kuwait City, Kuwait. And then there's the whole article about how the British foxed them out, outfoxed them. And uh, got control of Kuwait in, 19, in, 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 in 1899, which blocked the German idea to build the Autobahn from Berlin to Baghdad uh, and then on, on to uh, the Persian Gulf. Because really, if you study this, the underlying, the underlying cause of the First World War, and not to mention the Second World War, is an, was an ongoing feud between Great Britain, the British Empire, and Germany. That's the real, you say, what's the cause? What's the cause of World War I? What's the cause of World War II? Please tell me. I just did. The underlying reason for World War I, if you wanted to bring it all down to a simple point, what caused World War I? What caused World War II? An underlying, I mean, an ongoing feud, the cause of World War I and the cause of World War II, same cause, both wars, an ongoing feud between Great Britain, the British Empire, and Germany. This can be shown again and again and again. Chapter four, Algeciras and Agadir. Very fascinating. Chapter five, the passing of Persia. Talk about how Persia came under the dominance of Great Britain and Russia when the Germans were trying to get involved. The partitioners and their Poles, P-O-L-E-S. Poland. This chapter has not been written without giving consideration to the Russian point of view. There is an excellent book on Russia since the Japanese war from 1906 to 1912 by Peter Poliev. They talk about cutting up Poland. Oh, trying to be, you know, kind of deferential to Russia because Russia was a British ally until 1917, 18, 1918. And there's a map showing the division of Poland, the partition of Poland. Nice color map. 
uh, Italian Eridenta, Italian Eridentism. All the trouble caused by the House of Savoy, Victor Emmanuel, those kings, the, the, the House of Savoy, the kingdom of, kingdom of Sardinia in Genoa, Sardinia. Which renamed itself the Kingdom of Italy in 1860, if you remember. Okay, so all of the trouble there. The Danube and the Dardanelles. Fascinating chapter. The Danube River and the Dardanelles. The uh, passage from Europe, from the Mediterranean Sea to the, to the, to the Black Sea. Austria-Hungary and her South Slavs. This is a great chapter here because it talks about how Austria-Hungary had an idea. Remember, they had made the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then uh, Archduke Francis... Ferdinand, Franz Ferdinand wanted to uh, make a tripartite empire, the empire of Austria, hyphen Hungary, hyphen Yugoslavia. He wanted to placate the Slavs by making Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, a tripartite empire. But Serbia was determined that they were going to run that and they were willing to start a world war in order to accomplish that goal. And they did. And they did accomplish it. But they lost control of their empire. Remember, Serbia lost control of their Yugoslavian empire in 1991 or they began to lose control of it and then with the help of bill clinton <laughs> with his terror bombing campaign in 1999 they lost control of the rest of it racial rivalries in macedonia racial rivalries in macedonia no we don't mean whites versus blacks we mean different white tribes fighting with each other remember europe had uh, ethnic conflicts would be a more accurate term today not racial conflicts ethnic conflicts different white people fighting over what what is it nationalism all this white on white violence it upsets me the young turk regime in the ottoman empire this is about the young turks uh, who by the way were all freemasons you say well and they were revolutionaries well how about that Alex DeBeer Master says, what's up, Ron? Well, I'm talking about World War II. I was saying if anybody wants to ask me a question about World War II, go ahead. And someone asked me about the heavy water development program, and someone asked me about the uh, theory that Hitler might have escaped Europe. And did I hear about that? And I said, yes, I heard about it. Uh, Europe in 1911, very good map, color. So the Young Turks, yeah, they promised a lot. They're going to revolutionize the Ottoman Empire, modernize it, and make it like, you know, uh, Napoleonic France, all modern and everything. But they were mostly just a bunch of crooks and liars. Okay. Um, but they talked a good show. You know, they talked a good show. Crete and European diplomacy. This was about how they almost had World War I over Crete, the island of Crete. And how it became an international territory, kind of like a United Nations territory before they had the United Nations. And then after World War I, it became a, 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 Greek, a Greek territory. It was all Greek people. And then the war between Italy and Turkey in 1911. Yeah, first war that they use air attacks, by the way. The first war in which air attacks were launched. You know, at airplanes, 1911. The... the, the the Italian-Turkish War, interesting, a war most people don't know about. The war between the Balkan states and Turkey, the first Balkan War, yes. Yeah, yeah, most people don't know about that. The Balkan alliance against Turkey, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important chapter. Uh, Africa, 1914. Very important, very important. Showing all the colonies, including Rhodesia, South Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, which became an independent country uh, 39 years ago. 39 years ago on uh, oh, Thursday. Uh, Rupture between the allies. They show how the Balkan allies began fighting amongst themselves. No shock there. Wall, war between the Balkan allies. The Treaty of Bucharest. Uh, the Albanian fiasco. They had a second Albanian fiasco, remember, in 1999. 
Austria's ultimatum to Serbia. Germany pro forces the war. Well, according to this author's opinion, what do you expect? He's British. Many people would say, what? I have many German relatives and friends who would say, uh, Germany forced World War I, and they'd flip out. They'd really flip out. They can't look at it, you know, in a non-biased manner. I mean, they really come unwrapped. I, I have German people I know, and if you bring up World War I, the events of August 1914, they kind of go mad. They don't want to talk about World War II too much, you know. You say, what about the Second World War? Well, I don't want to talk about that. All right. They might think about it, but they don't want to talk about it. But they might think about it. All right, so that's that book. Alex says, hey, Ron, do you think Hitler is still alive? Well, he would be 100 and... Uh, 30 years old, I doubt he's alive at 130. What do you think? You think he's 130? Forty-seven straight eight says Hitler was a madman, useful idiot, etc. Who is who in your opinion was he really? Who was Hitler? Well, he was uh, born in Austria. He was a German soldier in World War II. One, he was the German prime minister, or they call it chancellor, but we'd say prime minister, right? From 1933 to 1945. Then he was also the German president from 1934, the, the, the German president from 1934 to 45. Only person to hold both offices under the title, the leader, the Fuhrer. Uh, yeah, makes you wonder, doesn't it? Who was Hitler? How did he go from being an obscure and failed artist to being the president, German president? Strange, isn't it? All right, uh, so the answer is I just told you what he is, what he was. You know what I mean? Mussolini and his staff, the leader of the fascists and his staff took over the government of Italy in a bloodless revolution. So there's Mussolini and his his gang, the fascist party. The bundle of sticks party. Mussolini. I bet he wished he'd have stayed neutral. And <laughs> there's the fascists after they took over Rome, the black shirts. Oh, Sean Marconi, the Dutch. Think about the Dutch. Now, here's an updated section at this 19. This is a 1941 book. This book was written in 1941, published in 41. It's fantastic because uh, it talks about the war was going on while the book was being published, you see. This book was published during the early stages of the war. So it's showing post-war Europe and Europe today. Europe at the end of 1939. Contrast the extent of Germany shown on this map with the extent shown on 712, the previous page. So they're so showing how uh, Hold on a second. <laughs> There's Germany in 1919, split into two pieces, you see. The gray area was given to Poland by the League of Nations, which caused a bunch of trouble. There's Germany in 1939, end of 39, all black area. Western Poland. And then there's Soviet Russia, and they, they show them under controlling Western, uh, Eastern Poland. And then the Soviet sphere of influence, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, under the Soviet sphere. They talk about 1933 to 1939. The history of Europe in those years is practically the record of repeated war scare, 
war scares and crisis after crisis. No doubt about that. Poland at the end of 1939 says, notice the division of Polish territory and the population among Germany, Russia, and Lithuania. So this is a very interesting map here. It's showing Poland being divided up. You, people are taught Germany took over Poland. It's true, Germany took over part of Poland. But the Soviet Union, Russia, took over Eastern Poland. Lithuania took over two sections of Poland, you see. Hungary and Poland, I mean, hung, uh, Hungary took over a section and Germany took over a spot. So you've got German controlled, German annexed, the government, government general, as they called it, the government general, that was central Poland. Germany annexed Lodz and uh, Danzig, uh, Katowice. And then Slovakia annexed Zips and Forava. So Slovakia annexed part of the country. I said Hungary, but it was Slovakia, Russia, the Soviet Union, Lithuania, and Germany. And then, let's see, Germany got 18 million people, Russia got 14 million, and Lithuania 500,000, half a million. Then they show Danzig, which, and this is about the have, the haves versus the have-nots, the haves versus the have-nots. Very interesting concept. Uh, show Helsinki, Prime Minister Chamberlain. They're talking about, I'm going to get off the air in a little bit. We can go and do another session about World War II. The fourth step in the plan of the have-nots. So they talk about the have-nots. This is the plan of the have-nots. Didn't work out, did it? Uh, well, they're like a gambler in a casino. They keep winning, so they don't they don't take their money and get out. You know what I mean? They never get out. They always get out. When do the people leave the casino? When they're flat broke, right? When they're busted, right? <laughs> the old story here. Okay, so the have-nots. It's a great book. The have-nots first ignore unfavorable treaties. So first they ignore a treaty. A nation may twist the inter interpretation of a treaty to suit its purposes. Next, the have-not nations demand concessions. Fear of an undeclared attack has placed conceding nations on the defensive. After the have-nots have made their demands, there is uncertainty as to whether they are bluffing. So step two succeeds. They ask for a slice of a territory or perhaps to control over neighboring peoples. By the very brazen character of their demands, they have gotten what they wanted. That is how Germany took back the Rhineland, absorbed Austria, brought Czechoslovakia and Poland under the control of the Third Reich, as Germany is now sometimes called. In much the same manner, Japan is now taken over territory of China. When the aggressors make a conquest, they are willing to sign treaties which will recognize their gains. The fourth step is to make new demands. They're talking about Italy uh, and all of this, but they said, but of obviously, but obviously the greatest example has been the course of Hitler's ambitions. After he brought Austria under the rule of Germany, under the rule of Germany in 1938, he rather easily secured the recognition of his act on the part of the of France and Great Britain. This he could do because those nations still hoped that by such a policy, a general European war might be avoided, but no sooner had the Austrian gains been made certain that Hitler made new demands. This time, Czechoslovakia became the victim. Again, the offensive method worked. Hitler got what he wanted and then treated politely with France and Great Britain to make sure that his gains would be recognized. <laughs> it says, this offensive method worked less smoothly I like how this guy writes. This is a this is a good writer, you see.
Alex says, hey, Ron, what book is that you're reading? It's called The Story of Nations from 1941 by Rogers, Adams, and Brown. Story of Nations. Great book. Great book. Um, this offensive method worked less smoothly when Hitler tried to use it to gain concessions from Poland. It is true that he conquered a large portion of Poland, but he did so only at the cost of entering a major European war. The consequences of this war, even to the so-called victor, may be tragic. Yeah, it was tragic. So, so that's this is this author is saying the same things I already said. What a disastrous decision to attack Poland and gain a little territory and have your whole country destroyed. So, the aggressors work on the principle that might might makes right. And how they use a fail complete. Yeah, Bill Clinton used that theory, might make us right. We're right because we're strong and we can beat you and you can't stop us. And uh, George W. Bush followed the Bill Clinton theme thematics, right? We're, we're, we're right because we're strong and we have better planes and we can bomb you and we can kill more of your people. See, so that was their, their thinking. We can, we're stronger, so we're right. So it says they, they use a pattern and it says Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister of Great Britain has tried unsuccessfully by appeasing the, the aggressors to persuade them to use reason rather than force and settling international agreements. <laughs> so this is their formula. One, renounce unfavorable agreements. Two, bluff concessions by a fait accompli. Just do something like grab the Rhineland. Be quiet for a while and sign new agreements. Make new demands, all the while armed to the teeth. <laughs> uh, It is plain to see that the conceding nations easily fell in with this formula. Their thinking ran somewhat as follows, quote, first make concession to these inter international bad boys who do things and then talk and then who cannot be counted on to declare war before they attack. Concessions may make friends. And secondly, if the aggressors can be kept friendly, that means peace. Peace in turn means prosperity, continue trade and keeping the things which have made us the nations which have, talking about the haves, strong and wealthy. It may be that if we make concessions, we can persuade the aggressor to settle further disagreements by reason rather than force. Often it may be necessary to swallow our national pride, but good business conditions are worth an occasional affront. There's always the chance that these aggressors may mean what they say and come over and bomb our cities. <laughs> Sound like talking to North Korea. Huh? Until we can build up our neglected arms of defense, there's no use taking chances with dictators. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They're going on. Uh, all right. Well, they got a lot of grass cutting started. I better get off. Archie Bunker, what if Hitler discovered the nuke? Guess he'd have used it if, if Roche Rosier says, I enjoy Pops Blue Ribbon beer. I do too. Let's see. Everyday Power says, Hey, fat face. And my response to that is, Hey, Everyday Power. As a history teacher, what were the greatest misconceptions students had about World War II? Oh, they had no misconceptions. They didn't know anything about World War II. So they couldn't have misconceptions because they had no conception. You understand? They were totally aloof to it. I mean, they might have known something that there was a war, but they didn't know who was the combatants or whose side each country was on. So that was basically, you can't have a misconception about something you don't even know about. What if, okay. So, uh, oh man, let's wrap this up. Then they talk about different ideas for government. This apartment house is a good example of the development of modern housing in Berlin, Germany. Most nations agree about the desirability of improving housing. So they're showing a German housing project. And Hitler and Mussolini were big on all these like New Deal type programs, like Franklin Roosevelt. We're gonna clean up the bad swampy areas and get rid of malaria and we're gonna build housing projects for the poor and have Coats for kids program would give all the children coats and uh, have youth programs and uh, try to build strong families, have these marriage programs where we train young girls to find the right man and 
here's how you raise a baby and uh, feed the baby right. And here's how you manage a household and shop for groceries, stuff like that, all that stuff. All right. Uh, all the countries did that, you know, Great Britain, France, Germany, Soviet Union, United States. Uh, civil rights and a democracy, they're talking about. The democratic principle shows itself not only in the working of Congress, but also in the rights of citizens to express their opinions and vote. Now they're asking a question, is this danger real? Fascism, is this danger real? Well, it might have been a danger that the ideology would spread. It wasn't any danger, really, that Germany was going to take over the world. But, uh, of course, today you see that uh, socialism is spreading around the world. Not national socialism, but international socialism. Uh, Left-wing socialism. You know what I'm saying. Um, communism, Marxism, whatever. Uh, then they talk about uh, war is a burden of civilization. We know that. World friendship has become the hope of mankind. Yes, unfortunately, we haven't practiced it. Uh, then there's a chart here. It says the shifting patterns of nations. Let's see about comments, then I'll go eat my lunch. <laughs> Germany had no feasible way to contain or conquer the United Kingdom, says CS. Oh, right, you're right. No way, they, had no, they didn't really have much chance of winning. It was nice talking to you, Ron. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and the rest of your week. I'll talk to you later. You too, uh, Alex. You have a good time now. Let me put my glasses on. Perse Persenrica says, was the whole war designed by Stalin? A master plan to get France and the British in war with Germany, and after that, the Soviets would beat the war nations and take over Europe? Uh, yeah, it could have been something like that. Uh, it was pretty clever, yeah. Didn't work out for him, but uh, yeah, I think he was trying to pump up a, a conflict between the European countries. Yeah, he did it pretty well for a while. He just um, kind of screwed up. So, SK77 says, it appears to be mostly forgotten that the net Nazis, so-called Nazis, National Socialists, actually, and the Soviets devised to invade Poland and split it among themselves, and the Soviets invaded Poland from the east, that's right, on September 17th, while Hitler struck from the west. That's right, Germany invaded September 1st. The Soviets most definitely wanted the Europeans at each other's necks, says Archie Bunker. Yes, that's right. And Hitler took the bait, right? So he gave them what they wanted. He wanted to he, he, he wasn't too good at looking at the big picture, I'm afraid. It was nice talk. Oh, here's the chart. Now, this is a great thing you should look at from 1941. The chart. This is like the, the uh, lineup chart. This is like the uh, all the teams competing chart. See that? You say, I ain't reading all that. I know you're not reading it because most people don't like to read, you know. Why, why read when you can be ignorant, right? Great Britain, they give you the area, the population, the political leaders, the main political problems. Here we go, Great Britain. Form of government, limited constitutional monarchy. Name of the head of government in theory, the king. Head of government in practice, the prime minister. King is the authority, the prime minister carries out the day-to-day -day operations of the government. Political leaders, Atlee, Chamberlain, Churchill, Eden, Halifax, Horace, Simon. Main political and economic problems to win the war. Protect lines of transportation and communications. Appease the Indian demands for a dominion status, which they end up giving India and Pakistan in 1947, to retain the majority support of the government, to finance the war, to retain friendship with the United States. Uh, her natural resources are relatively little surplus. The British Isles lack much, but the British Empire has everything. Uh, her immediate political friends, France, USA, Belgium, Turkey, Finland. Great Britain went to war with Finland in 1941, but that was because of the Soviet Union versus Finland. That was like 
They weren't really at war with Finland. Okay, that was just on paper. China, military dis dictatorship, president, the dictator, Chiang Kai-shek, correct. United States, Great Britain, and France are her major allies. France, Republic, Prime Minister Daladier, to win the war, defend herself against invasion, which failed, finance the war, maintain her empire, which has largely failed, although France still does have a lot of territories around the world today, by the way. Her main allies, Great Britain, until 1940, then the British started attacking France, United States, Belgium, Turkey. Germany, <laughs> National Socialist Republic, correct. National Socialist Dictatorship. Head of government, Reichsführer and Chancellor, Reichsführer and Chancellor, Hitler. He's the head of the, the head of state and the head of government, both. Political leaders, Goebbels, Goering, Hess, Himmler, Hitler, Ley, and von Ribbentrop. To win the war, they all got the same goal, to win the war. To prevent an uprising against the National Socialist Dictatorship, which occurred in 1944. To break the French-British blockade, which never worked. To import raw materials, didn't really work. To build up foreign credit didn't really work. To end the resistance of the Czechs didn't really work. To prevent a break in the Rome Axis, Berlin, Berlin Axis, Rome Berlin Axis. That did work until 1943, so it didn't really work. To get aid from Russia, <laughs> to get aid from Russia. That did work until mid-1941, but at the cost of exorbitant, exorbitant prices. That was part of the conflict between Germany and Russia. Russia was supposed to provide Germany with raw materials and then Germany would pay them in money, pay, pay them money and give them technology. But the Germans kept complaining, why are you charging these exorbitant prices? This is this wheat, you know, and this uh, tungsten or whatever is not worth the price that you're charging. And this, of course, Stalin said, oh, well, too bad. So th now, now listen carefully, to get aid from Russia and to check a too great expansion of Russia in the Baltic region to prevent Russia from expanding too seriously in the Baltic. Well, that didn't work and that led to the conflict, you see. And they talk about raw materials. Greatest concern, economic blockade by France and England, which they never did. French and English attacked by land, sea, and air. The British and French did not attack Russia, although they were planning to by virtue of helping Finland, but Finland surrendered before the British French expeditionary force was able to arrive. Uncertainty about Russian policies. Well, that continues today, right? That never changed. Uncertainly, uncertainty about Italy's support. Well, that, that was clarified on June 10th, 1941, uh, uh, 1940. Who are her immediate political allies? Who are Germany's immediate political allies? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, okay, so Italy joined Germany. But they were concerned at first because Italy didn't seem to be a re reliable ally. Well, of course, they wanted to see what was gonna happen. And then when it looked like Germany was gonna win, Italy jumped in to their dismay a year later. Ron, I want your thoughts on the concept of a purity spiral where a nation such as Germany introduces and supports eugenics. Well, it's terrible because you're manufacturing people like a factory, right? You get rid of the Lebens and Lebens, right? The lives unworthy of life. So the mentally retarded, the crippled, uh, you get rid of them like a commodity and then you only bring in the best it kind of goes along with the abortion industry in the United States. The abortion industry actually support. It's funny because the abortion industry, which is very heavily Jewish, gets a heavy Jewish support. Uh, they have sane people turn around and preach 10, 20, 29 hours a day about German eugenics and the Holocaust and all that. But I say, I say, yeah, but you support the same concepts, creating a better race, getting ready, getting rid of the unwanted people profiteering off of murder. Uh, so I say how ironic that the people who complain 10 days a week about the atrocities of Europe in World War II, the real and even the surreal, will 
turn around and support uh, a much bigger uh, version of mass murder in America and with a profit motive. So I find it ironic. And some of those are my beer review friends, but I'll be quick to tell them to their face. Now, if they couldn't take it, they could take their ball and go home, but I wouldn't hesitate to tell them if they brought up the subject. Uh, so who are Germany's immediate friends according to this chart? Russia, question mark. Italy, question mark. Well, Italy did become Germany's friend in warfare, but Italy was destroyed. Russia claimed they were Germany's friend according to the uh, German Rush Soviet Treaty of August 1939, but they didn't really act very friendly, did they? <laughs> okay, and Germany kept complaining about that. Well, you're supposed to be our ally, or at least our partner, maybe not an ally, but a partner, and you're not acting very much like a partner. And the Soviets kept saying, forget about it, forget about it. And they said, we can't forget about it. What are you talking about? And that led to the war. Okay, Italy, who are their friends? Spain, yes, Spain and Italy remain very close allies up until the destruction of Italy. Germany, yes. Russia, her main ally, Germany, until 1941, when that began to break down. It actually began to break down in 1940 during the Battle of Berlin, uh, the Battle of uh, the Battle of Britain. Uh, Italy, what? Italy to continue fascist control gain new territory, continue her policy of neutrality. Yeah, Italy was willing to stay neutral. If Germany had struggled very badly in 1939, 1940, Italy would have not joined the war. So they, they're basically, basically saying to sit back and see what happens. Greatest concern, what she can get from France and England, influence in the Balkans, influence in the Mediterranean, a Russian, a Russian German friendship. Yeah, it was Italy's advantage that they not have a war. And that's why Mussolini was very anti-war. Like he was saying, we ought to work it out, work it out. Italy could see, you know, Mussolini could see, this is not going to work out for us. I don't see this happening very favorably. But then he thought so incorrectly in June 1940. Oh, the jig is up. Let's jump in. It's over. Well, he was terribly wrong. Franco being more level-headed, you know, less of a hothead. Franco in Spain say, oh, no, no, I'm going to wait. I can see what this is. This is not the end. It's only the end of the beginning. <laughs> All right. Japan, ensure public support for the war policy, dominate the Far East, develop resources and conquer Chinese provinces, finance Chinese invasion, protect foreign markets, get adequate supplies of war material to counteract Soviet aid to China. And none of that worked. Uh, Greatest concern, interference by Great Britain, United States, and Russia, loss of markets. Yes, yes, yes. Germany and Italy, her major friends, yes. But friends that could not help Japan, could not help her. Japan could not help Germany and Italy, not in any practical way. And, it, and Germany couldn't really help Japan. Russia, maintain the communist dictatorship, which they did until December 1991. Acquire new territories, develop technological efficiency, stimulate cooperative foreign policy, improve transportation, overcome Finnish resistance, which they did. Main concerns, Franco-British hostility. German designs on the Ukraine. <laughs> Japanese advances in northern China. I see, so they had a lot to worry about. Her main ally, Germany. <laughs> United States, keep the balance between the three branches of government. Check the growth of bureaucracy. No, didn't happen, didn't happen. Devise tax program to meet expense of government. That happened. Strengthen the national defense. That happened. Protect and extend markets. That happened. Settle labor unrest. That happened. Keep a stable currency. Happened. Reduce unemployment. Happened. Provide farm relief. Happened. Conserve natural resources. Happened. To keep out of war. Didn't happen. Well, of course, we know Roosevelt didn't want to keep out of the war. But he, he said he did. He didn't, of course. Um, biggest problems, possibility of a Russian-German victory. Didn't happen because then they got into a squabble. Protection of neutral rights. No. Dominance of Japan in the Far East. No. Revival of foreign trade. Yes. European interests in South America. Well, you know, trade, but that didn't matter. Biggest allies of the USA. France, Great Britain, South American countries, China, Finland. Finland, okay. 
Um, and then in this book, they talk about how Germany, fascism or, or national socialism, German Nazism, national socialism was communism's right wing cousin. <laughs> Communism's right-wing cousin. I said, that's a great description. Communism's right-wing cousin. <laughs> well, I'm going to get off of here. Bucky Dentz says, uh, oh, Hitler did drink beer, but mainly low ABV stuff. He got delivered. He got it delivered from Holtz Kirchner Oberbrau Brewery. Yeah, Hitler was not a big drinker. He, um, he didn't like alcoholism and uh, heavy drinking, and uh, he was dead set against smoking cigarettes. Uh, he was one of the first world leaders to preach preach about the danger of tobacco, believe it or not. Um, Bucky Dent said, I would not say abortion and eugenics are similar in any way. My grandpa loves you, your channel, by the way. They are similar. They are similar because abortion comes from the eugenics movement, actually. Archie Bunker says 30%. 36% of abortion, I appreciate you, Grandpa, watching. 36% of abortions are black Americans who are only 13% of the population. That's over three times representation. A strong push for abortion affects those communities most. It's really sad. Yes, I think the liberals, and uh, we were talking about the Jewish uh, involvement in abortion industry, and that can be demonstrated whether you like talk about the subject or not. I uh, remember when they opened this, a new abortion, abortion factory in New Orleans, uh, who blessed it, blessed it, the, uh, Rabbi Cohen, Rabbi Cohn, Cohn, I'm sorry, Cohn, but Cohen, you know, he blessed the, uh, the opening of the abortion factory in New Orleans. And I said to myself and on the radio, I said, well, that's the synagogue of Satan. You see, that's Satanism. That's not a God blessing it. That's a satanic ritual. And the Bible even talks about that, the synagogue of Satan. That's not the true Israel. You see, that's 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 not that's that's uh when the Bible talks about Lucifer and the the fall of the angels, that that hit that rabbi, so-called rabbi, would be of the synagogue of Satan, a satanic rabbinical Satanism, we could call that. Okay, and I said that was so ironic that the same people who preach about the uh, Holocaust of Europe 29 hours a day in 12 days a week will bless uh, an abortion factory, which affects black Americans at a very high rate. So it makes you wonder who they really love, right? You say, how can you tell, how do you tell if someone hates a person? Well, Perhaps you could tell if you hate a person by the number of people in that group that you're trying to, to kill <laughs> or prevent from being born. So if, if a rabbi in New Orleans is blessing an abortion factory that will eliminate a high proportion of black Americans from ever being born, oh, well, you might get a, a better perspective on who hates who, right? Now, people don't like to hear these thoughts, you see. They say, oh, no, I don't like that kind of evidence because, oh, it's troubling. Well, it might be troubling. Doesn't make it any less true. Then Calvin Jung is making some racist comments. So, but he's probably a eugenicist. Maybe he's a rabbi of the synagogue of Satan. Sofa says, Calvin Jung, abortion is evil no matter what sort of leftist troll you are. I don't even pay any mind to that, uh, King, because liberalism has generally ruined minorities. Yes, it seems to be targeting minorities. If you, if you, if you study the left wing and liberalism, it seems very racist, very, very racist. They say, look at these, these animal people. Let's use them to, to advance our personal goals. Whoa and we'll wipe them out once we get power, you see. And and, the, and their mindset is these people are so dumb, they'll go for it. We can use them. I agree, if you can't raise a child, don't get pregnant. Good point. Sometimes people get pregnant on accident, right? <laughs> I assure you, I am anything but leftist, says Calvin Jung. Voltron, defender of the universe, says, hi, brother. Hello, Voltron. Well, I'm gonna get off of here. We could talk about World War II all day long. 
but I think we could talk about it many more times, many more times, and World War I and all of those conflicts. But what have we learned in the past? We have learned something. War is not healthy for children and other living things, and that's why we are anti-war. Watched you for years. Just now starts. You just now started streaming. Oh, no, I've been streaming for a while. Abortion might be evil, but kills children. Well, I'm not even going to entertain that. All right, do more history streams while having a beer. Thanks, Archie. All right, y'all, talk to you later. I'm going to eat lunch.